And start with the bonds. I mean, you do both bonds and stocks. Let's start with the bond side, because leading up to this, it felt like there's a reflation trade. We thought there may be a blue wave, mm -hmm. as they say. We're going to spend a lot of money. Last night, it looked like maybe people had a second thought. Yeah, no, I mean, you have to wonder about polling data again, and because uh, the markets had clearly aligned themselves to we're going to get a blue wave. And I, listen, I think the news of the day, I mean, obviously the presidential, the outcome is going to be significant. It's, it's super important for the economy. The Senate, the, care, the Republican carrying in the Senate is a major, A, major surprise, and B, major impact for the markets, because whatever the stimulus is, it's going to be significantly scaled down, as you talked about at your opening. Really big deal, and and so you know you talk about from the rates perspective, the rates market has just just breathed a uh, a significant sigh of relief that we're not going to see much higher rates. I actually don't find rates that interesting at these levels though anymore. In fact, I've been letting some go um, at these levels. It's uh, whereas I like yielding assets because we're going to now have a dynamic. We have a decent economy, and. Um, and, you know, presumably, if you don't have significant second wave of COVID, and so I actually find some of the risk assets, some of the yielding assets much more attractive than treasuries. So, Rick, as you say, it's partly about stimulus, because although people mm -hmm. tend to think we're going to get one, it's not going to be, it's have a two in front of it, I can put it that way. It's not going to be 2.5 trillion. It's going to be in the one range somewhere. Does that make enough of a difference? Or is it also some of the other things the vice president had planned, at least if he got the Senate on his side, some of the infrastructure spending, some of the big spending around the country? Oh, you're definitely right. I mean, <clears throat> that large spending program. Listen, I still think you're going to get a significant stimulus package. I do think that, let's say it is a, a Biden presidency. You know, that is a more mod or a moderate, I would argue, a moderate Democrat in many ways. And I think you will see some compromise. And by the way, the economy and the Fed's been calling for this. The economy needs more stimulus. You know, you hear all the time people say, guess the system can't take on any more debt. There, it is actually not true today because you know, talk about on your show, there's a series of dynamics around demographics, there's a series of dynamics around <clears throat> need for income <clears throat> that allows the system to take on a bit more debt, and the system needs stimulus to get employment to a better level. So, Rick, as we know, you don't don't <laughs> deal with bonds. You deal mm -hmm. with equities as well. Mm -hmm. Talk about the equity side of it. We heard that maybe health care is coming back, tech's coming back. Are those basically equities we figure, no matter what happens, those are going to do well? We don't have to get into speculation about other things. So I think the big thing is, you know, I think the you know significant increase. I mean, one of the major major programs is going to be raise taxes significantly, particularly corporate taxes. And I go back to the dynamic around the Senate staying Republican was a really big deal, and so tech and healthcare are two areas where taxes would have been a significant drag. And then obviously, to the extent that you'd have breakup of tech, that is taken off the table to some extent. So you're seeing it. By the way, we are letting some of those asset classes go today with this with this rally. Uh, it's a place where we've liked to invest, and so we're letting a little bit, a little bit of it go today. But, uh, but my sense is they're actually going to be in pretty good shape for a while on the back side of this. I think equities are going to continue to have a good run. So, where are the opportunities as you look out there as a, as an investor? Mm -hmm. Where are the opportunities this, at this moment? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if people take, you know, there's always you've got to invest for the short. You've got to think about the short term, and you try and think about what your entry and your exit point is relative to the short term. <clears throat> Over the intermediate to long term. People have to get returns into their portfolio, have to get yield into their portfolio. So we like the yielding assets. By the way, today was a pretty good day for emerging markets. And you think about if you have some more moderate, a more moderate president, potentially, you'll see where that is. But if you think about, you know, what it means for a currency, et cetera, I think emerging markets is an interesting place to play. I think yields, the bid for credit is going to continue. And then I think equities are going higher. Not that you can't if there's not some civil unrest or some you know, clearly some pushback, some litigation on the election. But I think equities are going higher. I mean, these earnings yields for equities, the cash flow yields you're getting from equities are really attractive. I mean, you can pull back like you did last week. But I do think if you think about the intermediate term, that's where the opportunity is going to be. I mean, buying the 10-year note at 75 basis points is not going to take your return to the uh, to the promised land. No, that, that's, that sounds for sure. No question about it. At, at the same time, you have to have some hedge, don't you? Because there's been a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. Is that real volatility or is that just <laughs> uh, not much liquidity in the market? So <clears throat> the markets are not terribly liquid. I mean, well, last night I've been up, <laughs> sorry, I've been up much of the night. So the um, uh, you know we have to manage our portfolios through some of this pretty crazy volatility. Liquidity overnight, liquidity this morning is less than less than deep. 
But, um, but you know, that will go away and things will stabilize, particularly once we know what the outcome of the election is. Then we'll get more data potentially around around COVID. But I think you've got to think about your portfolios. You know, when you manage, manage um, you know, any investment portfolio, you've got to think about what's the intermediate term that you're looking at. So how do you hedge today? Like you said, interest rates are not a great hedge. The only thing that is a great gold is not a great hedge. I would argue we have a piece of gold in our portfolio. So what do we do? I just think you got to hold more cash than you've had than you've had before. And so you have some beta yielding assets, some equities in the portfolio. But I think you've got to hold a higher level of cash in the uh, than you have historically, particularly to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. Well, in fact, if that reflation in trade really comes off, <laughs> at least to some extent, does that mean the cash mm -hmm. you're holding is worth more? That is to say, the dollars seem to be weakening going into that reflation trade. Yeah, now it's a great call. I mean, I, you know, cash, you, know, <laughs> you think about where treasuries are, cash is not that expensive <laughs> to hold relative relative to other assets. And and like you say, listen, I still think inflation, I still think having some tips and break-evens in the portfolio, tips in the portfolio makes some sense. But, you know, repricing it a bit, given where we could have gone, I think makes makes some sense. But then, you know, like you say, cash is not an expensive asset. But gold, by the way, I would argue crypto is not a, not a bad asset in the balanced portfolio today. And I, I don't think those trades have gone away. So, Rick, give me a little glimpse into last night for you. As you said, you were up pretty mm -hmm. much all night long. <laughs> I've never been involved in trading. When you saw, for example, that 30-year yield just, just really gap as a practical mm -hmm. matter, go 11, 12 basis points, something, what did you do? <laughs> Well, I have to say, I didn't do, I didn't sell them at the at that point. I wish I had. The um, you know, the first thing you do, you got to be a little bit patient because the market, you know, the markets aren't that deep, <clears throat> and then and then the news is, you know, the news is very uncertain at that point in time. So, you know, you do some things around, you know, the equity markets were pretty, you know, you could get some things done. So we did a little bit in the equity market at the time when, uh, when particularly when equities were coming off, and we bought a bit into the equity market. But you got to be patient. I mean, one of the things you can't push. And the markets are that illiquid, particularly in overnight hours. You can't really push on trades uh, because it's just the depth of the market is not is not that significant. You know, when you come in this morning, as New York comes in, you know, London is still operating. You have a bit more depth. You can start to operate, and then <clears throat> markets, you know, create some extremes, and then you try and operate around some of these extremes. I mean, the equity market. I mean, when I, you know, early early this morning, I think it was three in the morning, three thirty in the morning. Equity market was down, and. Um, you know, so you had some some decent opportunity then, but you know, you got to be careful about the size you do in these types of markets. Rick, it strikes me we had this wonderful conversation, and it's all been about the election and the aftermath <laughs> of the election. There is that COVID nineteen out there that hasn't gone away, uh -huh. as best I can remember, and it gets a vote <laughs> in what happens with asset mm -hmm. classes, with our lives. In fact, how do you factor in COVID nineteen and where it's headed in Europe and in the <laughs> United States? So, David, the, the most incredible thing I think about people, people who work with me, I've said this way too many times, markets can only do one thing at a time. It's like, just tell me I need, to, I need to focus on the election, and then I'll focus on COVID. They can only do one thing at a time, which is the most remarkable thing. Uh, again, the world of big data, the uh, markets can actually only operate in small data uh, circles. But the uh, listen, COVID is a big deal. I mean, look at the data in Europe. I know a little bit better in the last 24 hours or so. But you're right. I mean, I think once we get through this, then that is still a daunting dynamic, and particularly in parts of Europe, they're still locked down in some places and potential here. So it is um, that's not going away. And I think you know it's going to take a week or two, and then that's very much going to be at the forefront. And that's why you can't get too overzealous and uh, about, gosh, let's take a lot of risk today, and we got to hold more cash in the portfolio. We're definitely not out of the woods there with regard to COVID, and and you know not not out of the woods in terms of we're going to have vaccine tomorrow either.